hundred percent. You you said that so well. Thank you. <laughs> you said that so well. I have nothing more to say. But that's exa- I think you are my therapist. <laughs> I, I think you just. I'll then we'll charge you later. Yeah, yeah. Hey, the CZ Podcast is brought to you by us, CZ Studio, the number one dance app on the App Store and Google Play Store with over one million downloads. We provide curated online dance classes taught by the world's best instructors. Why did we create Steezy? To help you reach your dance goals one step at a time. Whether that goal is to perform with the biggest and best musical artists in the world or just be the life of the party at your cousin's wedding. I'm your host, Clay Boone Tanakit. Let's get to it. Mackenzie Dustman. Do you have a middle name? Dare. Dare. Yes. That's fire. Mackenzie <laughs> Dare Dustman. You know, so you think you can dance season 10, top 10, season 11, all stars. ABC's Dancing with the Stars, <laughs> Little Big Shots guest performer, Break the Floor assistant, Still Motion Contemporary Company, High Strung Free Dance Movie, MTV's Awkward, Olympic Ice Skating Show Art on Ice, <laughs> Jesse J, The Jacksons, Shaka Khan, <laughs> Tom O'Dell, Nelly Furtado, Justin Bieber, Anna Kendrick, Khalid, Fuller House, and many, many more things. You're, she's, she's got time. She's not that busy, basically. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's chilling. Busy. Yeah. Hi, Mackenzie. Hello. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here on your, your time off. I really yes, appreciate it. Of course. So today, just like all of our podcasts, we want to learn a little bit more about where your journey stemmed from in all aspects. We can talk family, we can talk emotional or just simple dance experiences. But yeah. first, I want to start with some rapid fire questions. Okay. Okay. Ooh, we're okay. my brain. Okay. <clears throat> Pick your favorite. Paul Rudd, Jude Law, Harry Styles. Ooh, Harry Styles. I'm so typical. Okay. okay. Favorite piece of topping. Tapatio. <laughs> Tapatio? Yeah. Tapatio. Like the sauce? Not yeah. Like, okay. Yeah, it's weird. Well, we don't need fair. to talk about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Most ordered Mexican dish. Ooh. Ooh, hold on. Carne and Sahugo. What is that? Oh, it is. Do I even know what it is? So it's carne asada in a lime, like drenched in lime sauce. Fire. Yeah. Is it creamy lime? Is it just Or am I lying? Or is it mushroom sauce? It's either or. It's either a limey sauce or like a mushroom sauce. But it's bomb. Love it. Love it. Okay. Airbnb or hotels? Airbnb. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Siberian Husky or Boxer Labradors? I'm just kidding. I can't make you pick. I can't make you pick. <laughs> I was going to say Severe and Husky, yeah. which is really rude, but I love my, bo- I love my boxer, so. Uh, favorite grape varietal for wine? Ooh. You said favorite? Grape varietal. So your favorite wine, basically. That was a really, like, fancy word. <laughs> like grape variety. It's like, uh, yeah, not specific company, but okay. kind. Um, probably a Zinfandel. Zinfandel? Yeah. You like red or white Zinfandel? Red. Red Zinfandel. Yeah. Oh, you like that? Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. Punch. All right. Mint chip ice cream or wine? Mint. Wow. Big. I love mint chip. Yeah, it's so okay. good. Okay. How to get away, how to get away with murder or Westworld? Oh, Westworld for sure. All right. Yeah. There you go. Mm-hmm. There's a little rapid fire. Get to Fun. know. Fun. <laughs> so, Mackenzie. I grew up in a family of performers. Mm -hmm. My uh, father's a storyboard artist, mother was a fashion designer, brother's a chef. Wow. Extended family, like actors and stuff. Have you seen the movie 13 Lives? Mm -mm. No. no. My uncle's like plays the governor in that movie as well. Like I just have like this this artistic family, weird Asian family. And I know that you have sort of a similar upbringing with your family. Yeah. Could you tell me a little bit about them? Yes. So (laughs) my mom and dad are singers. Singers. And Before I was born, they created a jazz group called Beachfront Property. And yeah, so my dad was a uh, music professor at a college in Long Beach. So my family grew up, we grew up in Lakewood. Lakewood. And from like all of his students there that he met, he pretty much curated this jazz this jazz band. Oh, like he picked students and some built stu- it? Some were students and then some oh, were see. his friends through the years and pretty much like created this jazz band. Okay. Um, and it ended up being, by the end of it, it was like 20 plus years okay. of doing that. Um, it ended up ending with it being my mom, my dad, my aunt, and my uncle. Whoa. <laughs> so by the time that I was born, um, it was this jazz quartet. And so I grew up going on tour with them. Really? Um, they would sing at like jazz festivals and concert halls, old folks' homes. 
Um, and it was it was a really special upbringing, like huh. a very musical, very artistic, very loud. Um, <laughs> my brother is actually a professional heavy metal drummer. <laughs> so oh, he, he started teaching himself how to drum when he was like 11. Okay. And then once he hit 14 or like six, uh, 15, 16, he was in my parents' band um, wow. and played drums for them. So my family was heavily impacted by music and, and art. Wow. So it was very, very natural for, for me to kind of choose that as w my Were there other thing. dancers? My sister. Okay. So my sister's eight years older than me. I'm the, young, mm -hmm. the youngest of three. Um, so my sister, because she was so much older, there wasn't like a bunch of overlap. Um, but there was a time where like we were training together at a local dance studio yeah. and, you know, having like those awkward sister duets that uh, were like really bad. Yes. But but cute. That yeah, would like make mom cry. Like that, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um and I mean it's really cool because so I so I grew up touring with my family mm -hmm. and just watching them like sing. They would do covers of old jazz music. So I mm. freaking love jazz. Jazz mm. is just like it feels like it's like embedded in my DNA. Ah. Um as well as like music by the Beatles. Like if I hear a soundtrack of the Beatles or anything, like I feel instantly, tell like I, I teleport back into time, being backstage, hearing my parents wow. sing. And they would do covers and harmonize and everything. And so those, those memories are like the sweetest memories of my mm. childhood. Um, but it's cool because from a young age, I was traveling a lot, but my sister, once she graduated from college, she was the first one in the family to get work outside of the US. Oh. And so that was she kind of trailblazed for us and opened up that opportunity that okay. you can work internationally. So your 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 parents didn't do No, that? it was mostly just like American okay. um, American touring. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Pretty wild. It was a, it was a wild it was a wild upbringing, but so fun. Yeah. So fun. Did, was there like a particular like first style of dance you got into that relates to that? Were you like or did you go like ballet? And, like yeah, so it was a pretty like typical mm. studio kid upbringing. So my mom knew that I loved dancing from a really young age and okay. performing in general. Yeah. Um, but they sang like a lot of ballads, and I I think that definitely influenced me naturally. Like mm. I loved. I was just an emotional kid, okay. pretty naturally. Um, but I think once they saw that I connected to music like that, they actually would have me perform from a pretty young age at their shows and oh, really? stuff. Yeah. Um, and I remember singing or like dancing to some of their slower music. And I think maybe that was the impetus to mm. me loving lyrical at the time yeah, yeah. and ballet and, and slower things. Um, so yeah, huh. I don't know. It's no, interesting. That's... It's interesting to know how that maybe affected my psyche at the time. Yeah, I don't know. We'll, we'll like we'll dig into that. We'll yeah. think about it. Yeah, we got time. We got time. Interesting. And so like, I mean, that means that you became a performer really early on as well. I mean, since like since the moment I could walk, my mom knew because I was constantly trying to like congregate people and like move them to watch me oh. dance. But it was fascinating because my mom was like, "Oh my gosh, she wants to perform. Like yeah. she genuinely loves it. She's like." 10 months old, she's walking around <laughs> with her little diaper and she's like ushering us to like sit down and watch her. Um, so I think she naturally thought, oh, let, like, let me put her in dance. Um, and when she did, I ended up hating it. Ooh. And it was because I was a painfully shy kid. I was <gasps> so, really? I was like, like so shy and so uncomfortable moving publicly. Wow. That I pretty much was like, I mean, I wasn't diagnosed with anxiety at that age. I was so young, but I definitely had symptoms of of having anxiety wow. attacks and and having severe social anxiety. Um, but she knew she was like she loves it so much. She's doing it at home. Like the moment she gets home, she's so free. Mm -hmm. But the moment I put her in public, she's kind of crumbling. Mm. But she knew she was like, this is just we're gonna have to continue to do this. She needs she she needs this push through. So from like two to seven years old, I was really challenged and having to show up like that That's but it was weird because i loved i freaking love dance but it was a very personal thing it felt like an uh, intimate an intimate relationship mm, mm, mm. that wasn't um i just wasn't comfortable doing it in front of people it was so fascinating so, but but you but you congregated people naturally my family and i don't know if i mean i am just a, like i love my family still mm. we're so close mm. i think my family they always want me 
they always made me feel seen mm. and acknowledged. And I think I just didn't know if that came with strangers. Yes. And I didn't want to be vulnerable in front of people. Maybe. Yeah. Um, it was just scary. I think I share a f fairly similar experience. I think that like something that I always, not always, I learned to love about my family later mm -hmm. on in life was I realized my my father always gave me the time of day hmm. to to watch whatever I did. Hmm. If I made a little video, made a little claymation video, I would <laughs> I would do it in like you know his desk is there and I'm right here and I would go, yeah. like, Dad, can you look? And hmm. like he would puts, humor you. Puts down his like pencil because he draws. He puts down hmm. his stuff and he just watches it. Hmm. You know, and yeah. I didn't realize how special that is. Yeah. So many parents are like I got to work. I got to finish this yep. job. I got to do this thing. Yep. And I was like. Wow, like that's what I want to do for my kids too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I definitely think that made me feel safe, um, and they absolutely nurtured that kind of environment. Wow. But you know, you're not so lucky when you get into public situations like yeah. that. Not every teacher is willing to see you yeah. and comfort. And my parents too. They were had a very gentle approach mm -hmm. to raising their children. So you know, being challenged and yelled at by teachers, it yeah. wasn't something that. I was naturally resilient towards, but it was so, I, my mom knew it was so, that kind of development was really important mm. in my grow, growth process. And that's why she continued to put me in class mm -hmm. and and let me struggle through that experience. Yeah. And I'm grateful that she did. Um, but it is, I mean, I think there's still a part of me that loves to preserve uh, the intimacy of my relationship with dance. And I mm. think that's still something that is important to me. And I think that's actually something that Philip and I really are similar mm -hmm. with. Oh yeah, to clarify, Philip, who's Philip? My man, I wasn't my lady. That was so weird. <laughs> <You know? laughs> my lady. 2022. Yeah, yeah. He's everything. Yeah. He's everything. This is Philip Jabib, right? Yes. So Philip was, was previously on the podcast in one of our other episodes, yes. so. This is the Philip we're talking about. Yes, he's my human, my life partner. Um, I think something that we both, what made me feel like he was my family is that he understood that feeling of, and it's hard to find in this industry, but of preserving an intimate relationship with yourself and mm. your craft and not having to always put it on display and mm. feel like you're performing. We both really value um, being alone with that and nurturing that relationship, so. Did you, at a certain point of your life, give up a lot of that part of you, that that hmm. self-intimacy, and then have to relearn to come I, back I think, to that? I think for sure. I, I think more recently, hmm. that is something that I've maybe not necessarily put on the back burner, but naturally right now, I've been mostly a professional dancer that's taken up more territory in my life than being a choreographer being a choreographer and on the creative side of things is more recent. Yeah. Um, and with that transition, I think naturally your relationship with movement and dance starts to change. Yeah. And I mean, yesterday was the first time it's, I heard a piece of music and it just instantly brought me to, to emotions and tears. Mm -hmm. And I haven't felt that in a long time. And I was like, God, I haven't felt like there's no way out of this feeling unless I dance. Yep. And so I took um, that moment for myself. I took like an hour and I was like, God, it's been years. It's been years since I've just heard a piece of music and had no intention of product mm. or of anything <laughs> other than just coming back into myself and like meeting myself again. Yeah. I, I think that's the most beautiful thing about dance that mm. it, even though the relationship changes throughout your life, if you're willing to like look at it and meet it again, it will meet you halfway and be yes. like, I'm here for you, whatever you need. Yes, yeah, I agree with that. I think that it's super healthy to understand dance and yourself as there is a relationship. Yes. Because I think a lot of people um, mm -hmm. fall into a space of like dance is something you do. I do this, Yeah. right? And it's true, you do dance, you do do that thing in particular, but when you treat it as a relationship, you realize that that whole thing where people are like, dance is a lifestyle, you know, yeah. people say dance is yeah. a lifestyle, yeah. but it becomes, it becomes who uh, a part of you in a much more intimate way yeah. when, when you honor it like a relationship, like people you love mm -hmm. and you allow it to do the same thing mm -hmm. back, right? And that can be a really hard thing to practice especially once it becomes your career mm -hmm. because it becomes really murky and it's really, I mean, it's really hard to set those boundaries and yeah. be like, God, I love, I love what I do, 
and this is even something that I'm realizing this year, I love what I'm doing so much that it can be murky when I need space mm. from it. And until I'm home, like physically home yeah. and at my house, I'm able to like reassess and be like, what do I, do I need to like keep working? I love my work. No, I need to like sit with this. Uh, and that's how I felt yesterday. I was like, I can continue to create or I can just meet dance again in a way that I did when I was younger. And that was nice to feel that for a moment. Cause that's not something that I always humor. Yeah. So many of our, our, our listeners, our Steezy subscribers, you know, they want to make dance their career. Yeah. And I think exactly what you're saying is a really, it's a difficult thing because we often, we often can't be super proactive about mm -hmm. it because mm -hmm. we feel dance so intensely that <laughs> yeah. it's not like, oh, you know, like I know at some point I'm going to run into a space where dance is murky. So at that point, I'm like, you can't really prep for that. No. But I think in those yeah. moments we need reminders and we need to see people like yourself who, who are experience those, um, experiencing those feelings so that we can be like, oh, yes, it's okay to just sit in it, just yeah. enjoy it, not, not make a product as you right. said. Right, right. And then it's really hard too because playing devil's advocate to that, you also need to show up to create things every day in order to make it sustainable yes. as a lifestyle and yes. as a job. And again, I think that's when it does get murky and a little bit confusing, um, but that is the beautiful process. And mm -hmm. I love that process. And that's how I know that I, like this is the challenge I wanna face. Yeah. And so I'm down for figuring out the nuance between when I need to rest and reconnect with myself mm. or when this is for a product and for something that is for other people. Yes, totally agree, totally yeah. agree with that. So moving into another space involving training mm. in dance, mm -hmm. because there's so many ways that you can engage in dance training. Yeah, nowadays you know, it's nowadays, just Nowadays, right? Insane. You yeah. can do You can do YouTube, yep. you can do a studio, mm -hmm. you can do Steezy, you yep. can do, you can travel across seas, yeah. right? Yeah. And I know that for you, you, you spent like 2012, Mm -hmm. in the Netherlands, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You went, you were an NDT, like what was it, Nether Netherlands Dance Theater, yeah. right? Yeah, I did their workshop when I was like 17. You did their workshop? Yes, yeah, so okay. they, they yeah, had explain. a, it was pretty much a summer camp. Okay. Um, and I tried out, gosh, it was so cool. So just a little history on this. So I grew okay. up full studio kid. Okay. Going to like showstoppers dance competitions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And heavily influenced by competitive culture, but there was definitely a part of me that ached for style and artistry beyond technique. Okay. And I naturally had really flexible feet hmm. and like really good lines. So everyone was kind of naturally pushing me into a more technical direction, but there was a part of me that like wanted to be really weird. That makes sense. And yeah. there was just no facet for that, that I knew uh, of. I was like, oh, it's either this or nothing. Hmm. And I remember when I was 15, my I was so <laughs> grateful for, my teachers, they were like my parents, still still in my life. Yeah. They're just incredible. They were those teachers that were willing to go outside of themselves for resources to help me learn. So if it meant me going to another studio to gain knowledge, they were so down for it. Really? And it was also a very different generation. Yeah, so they were because, really open to that. Because studios. Oh, nowadays, they, nowadays it's, I mean, in general, it, it's much more isolated and each kid feels really independent. Yeah. Um, so it was all about like, more camaraderie at the time, I think. But they were, they just wanted me to be happy and they wow. didn't want to put a cap on what they could teach me. And there was a point where they knew, okay, either we can just like keep her isolated <laughs> and here, yeah. but that would literally Stunt destroy birth. her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it and they just, they were so, I, I don't know how they knew what to do, hmm. but they pretty much, um, they, they set me up for a private audition, I didn't even, or not a private audition, it was a, just a sneaky audition. I okay. didn't even know it was an audition yeah. that was happening at our studio. And it was for an outside, an outside, it wasn't a dance program, it was technically another dance studio called West Side Dance Project. Okay. And they trained every Sunday for like five hours. And it was a really, it was something that I'd never really known of before, but it was all about, um, educating the dancer on dance history when it came to like modern dance mm. and dance theater and companies. And that's something I didn't know existed. Like just uh, competitive uh, dance existed. I didn't know there was a world beyond, uh, conventions were still fairly new at the time, yeah. but I didn't know there was anything outside of that wow. that called for a little bit more artistry 
and, and space to challenge what technique has been for people. And so once I started training with West Side Dance Project, I started learning about NDT. I started learning about William Forsyth, all of these people that were originators of these styles that challenged ballet. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is my shit. Like, wow. this is so cool. And so from 16, from like 15 to 17, I was training with them. And my teacher, Jesse Hartley at the time, she opened me up to this audition for NDT and was like, I think you should just go for it. And I was like, this is the best company in the world. I'm so tiny. Why would I do this? I'm scared. Like that makes no sense. This is in Amsterdam. At the time, I, I had never really traveled outside of the US for anything other than like visiting my sister on her work. Mm. So I was like, and I was traveling alone and I was like, this well, you is, went alone. I went alone. It was Whoa. like my first big girl trip. It was so important. Um, and that, that experience opened my brain. I remember the first day we were there, we were sitting down and I was just with all of these different cultures and people yeah. that I'd never been exposed to before. And we were asking questions and asking like, what does it take to be a member of this company? And if you guys don't know Netherlands Dance Theater, it's just something that you need to okay. know and you need to delve into. It is the most renowned take on movement. It is, in my opinion, the epitome of high art and it's just it's just beyond what I see in in our industry. Yeah. Um, but anyways, so one of one of the first nights there, she was like, you know, uh, what does it take to be a part of this company? And yeah. she literally just said, like, you have to be a ballerina with balls. And I had just never heard anyone say anything like that before. Yeah. And I was like, this is so cool. <laughs> so after after that experience, I was like, this is what I want to like do I want to be in a company and I want to I want to strive for that which is really funny because that ended up never happening oh but I well I ended up going for so you think a year later oh. and so you think completely changed the trajectory because I was like I'm gonna be like a cool company dancer that like lives in New York wow. and then goes to Europe uh you know LA's lame yeah <laughs> you know I hated LA because I, I kind of grew up in like visiting a lot I actually went on a lot of auditions my mom wanted me to like act at some point so I was kind of doing that I just I hated coming to LA I hated auditions I wow. hated all of it so I was like fuck LA I'm gonna go in, <laughs> I'm gonna go to New York and then so you think completely interrupted that whoa and I, I just kept making it through all the rounds and I was like what is happening and it just changed the whole trajectory but it's so crazy because <laughs> I'm jumping around a bit okay. and we can always like dive into these things deeper, but it's just funny to think about it in this way. A couple years later, after So You Think, I'm 22, I'm fairly young, I end up meeting Philip, my now fiance, and we start dating and it's a very instant connection. Mm. We know that this is it mm. and we know that this is something that we wanna grow into together. And so we're starting to like work together and he he gets an email like a couple months into us dating and he's like, this, um, I, I got this email from this company, NDT, mm. and they want me to go to Amsterdam to choreograph <laughs> oh. for them. And I'm literally just shitting my pants. I'm like, and he's like, I've never heard of them before. I'm like, what is this? I'm like, Philip, you don't understand what this means. And I had never in my life heard of that company outsourcing choreographers from America. Yeah. Because that just was, like if anything, American choreographers are heavily, heavily influenced by NDT. Mm. And that's one of the hardest things because NDT is so removed mm -hmm. from this industry that people don't know that they are pretty much, like especially when it comes to contemporary. They're like pace setters. Yes, yeah. they are they are the ones in the front of the line, wow. like going into the unknown. And then we're like, oh, that worked. Yeah. And we get very inspired by And we get a lot of it. that like, like trickle down exactly. through people that, yes. and we don't know it's NDT. Exactly, and it is it is them. Um, so I had just never heard of them outsourcing choreographers from yeah. America before. And I was like, this is insane. And I was like, you have to do it. I don't care what the pay is, but you have to do it. Wow. He's like, well, do you want to go with me? And I was like, oh my God. I was like, I'm not, I'm not certified. <laughs> I'm not qualified for this. But I was like, you know what? I was like, I've I've been before. Yeah. I spent, you know, weeks getting to know that company. And the beautiful thing about that program 
was how intimate it was mm. and how all of those those choreographers and people mm. that I just grew up admiring, I was in a room with taking ballet with and asking like deep questions. They followed me on Instagram after we were constantly connecting. Yeah. And I was like, this is so crazy. And I couldn't believe that they remembered me when I went back with <gasps> Philip. Oh, that's so so nice. I go back into the space and it's so crazy because so many weird overlaps and, and, and it felt like fate in a sense. Um, but a lot of people that I, was in the workshop with at the time, a lot of them became company members. So oh. I knew them really well. They were already friends. And some of the friends that I grew up in Westside Dance Project, they were new members of it as well. So it was so, it was such a small world and such a random overlap Man. of coming back to a time in my childhood that changed my perspective on dance and then being able to come at it with this new person that I loved so much that was so opposite of that culture. He grew <laughs> up strictly street dance. He yeah. taught himself how to dance. Yeah. And all of a sudden this prestigious contemporary <laughs> ballet company was asking him to choreograph for them. It also changed my whole perspective of what the right way of doing things was. Oh. Because I was like, oh, so you just, you just did your own thing yeah. your whole life. And that's okay. And that's okay. And that got you an opportunity that probably most people wouldn't have that would go about it the right way. Yeah. So it was really, it was such a huge time for my brain. Mm. Um, just like worlds colliding and it was so cool. It was so special, that, wow. whole, that whole period of time. I love that full circle. Yeah, That's and I don't know where that lands us now. <laughs> I forgot what the question was. I don't even, it's okay. I was just, yeah. I just asked about the general idea of MDT. So yeah, you yeah. you gave me the specifics. Yes. I love that so yeah. much. And what's even funnier about it is that we didn't do very good <laughs> on the job itself. It really? was, it challenged us. There were, we learned so much about pacing because again, we love doing things for film and television. Yeah. So doing a live 20 minute show and learning how to pace choreography mm. and concepts was something that was hard for both Philip and I. And I had really never done anything like that before. I wouldn't have even called myself like a choreographer's yeah. assistant or anything. I was I was still like solely- This is after solely, So You Think? This is right after So You okay. Think pretty much. Uh, I, guess, I guess like three or four years after. Okay. But I was heavily just a dancer, like Got professional it. dancer Got doing it. dance jobs. So when I came out with him as an assistant, again, I was like, I should not be like mm. giving ideas to this company because I'm influenced <laughs> by the company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> it was really scary for me to do that. Um, and in hindsight, I know we would do it a lot different, sure. but we learned so much about pacing wow. things for live shows. It's, it's crazy really to think about how, I think a lot of people are, our listeners are gonna be getting experiences and opportunities in their yeah. life. Maybe it's teaching their first dance class. Maybe yep. it's to kids. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's <laughs> performing in a show. Maybe it's mm -hmm. getting on TV. I don't know. Yeah. And we will always, like, you're like, I'm not qualified to do this. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right? Like, like, these are the people I've watched for so long. Yep. Or I'm dancing next to the people I've always looked up to. Like, yep. I still feel that way. I yep. just got back from my Mexico trip teaching at a dance camp. And people next to me are Sean Evaristo, <laughs> Larkin Poynton. I'm just like, oh, you <laughs> Why am I here? My heroes, you know? <laughs> yeah. And and we're going to keep experiencing these things. And we're going to do the job. And we're going to do it as best as we can do it. Yeah. And then you're going to learn. Yep. And it's crazy to think that like this thing, this this theater, this company that you respected so much invited Philip and you said, we did okay. <laughs> we did okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I wouldn't change that memory or that experience for anything yeah. because it was supposed to be stressful. Mm. It should, we weren't prepared for that. Mm. Neither of us, we, we wouldn't have done it any differently. It was always gonna be a bit of a shit show. <laughs> and of course, maybe it, it w wouldn't be what we would do now, but we didn't have that information then. So how mm. could we expect ourselves to have a different outcome? Yeah, I'm just so glad we did it. I'm so glad that we were awkwardly trying to handle it. And of course, I wish that I would have believed in myself more, mm. but I was so young. Yeah. And of course I, I put, I, I idolized them. So again, I, I wouldn't, I couldn't change anything about it. And I've yeah. learned so much from that experience that it's just too, it's too important for it to be a different memory. Mm. And, and and zooming out from that also, just just for the listeners, like yeah. you, you said oh, you were so young, you were 22, yeah. right? So many, so many dancers, so many soon to be potential dancers are starting when they're 13 and 16. They're like, I don't know. I know people that started when they were three or two. Let me tell you, when you start when you're three or two, it's really beneficial in some ways and can also be really detrimental. 
I am evidence of that. Yeah. I feel like I started my actual dance career when I was maybe 24. Wow. And I started technically when I was two. But it's because as a studio kid and competitive dancer, you get really good at taking direction. Mm. And this is the reason I've loved being exposed to street dance culture through my relationship with Philip and witnessing him and his history with it Yeah, is because street dance is all about individuality and who are you mm -hmm. and how are you different than the person next to you. Yeah. And I was taught as a child to look like the person next to me mm. and to not make up my own movement, uh, to be really good at taking other people's creative direction. And yeah. that was something that I got really good at. Mm. But until I was about like 20, yeah, 24, it was the first time that I was like, well, what do I like visually? Yeah. That has nothing to do with anyone else. And that's kind of when I found floor work oh. as a safe place to start experimenting with wow. movement because I hadn't I had always seen floor work and I know it's always something that people have uh specialized in and and explored but yeah. for me I was like god I feel safe down here and I want to like sit here for a couple years and wow. find out what I can find here but that didn't start for me until 24. it <laughs> took me so I was doing really good at doing other things yeah but it's just like you said you're always going to be missing something yeah you're always going to be missing out on some sort of experience on how you grow up because mm -hmm. you can't get all of them. Exactly. But that's the beauty of, I think, being in your 20s is you get to be like, do I want to keep doing what I've been doing for that, like the last 20 years or do I want to interrupt this momentum and challenge mm -hmm. the fuck out of myself? <laughs> yeah, I think it's like when you run into the the difficulties of just experiencing life as, as a person that can't lean on too many things. Yes. You know, like it's great. Like we do have supportive families like yeah. what a blessing you know yeah. but yeah. we've also had to even like simple like oh should i have to pay taxes i don't know how to do this or i need to do <laughs> oh this. yeah all these things start influencing your dance and start making oh. you like re-question like oh should i be doing things the same way and it's funny because it's not a direct link but it is so so impactful on just who how you think who you are as a person how you make decisions yes you know? yes I think absolutely that's cool. absolutely i want to get us into some of these voice messages yeah all right. let's do it so for our listeners if you do not know we have a new segment here where we basically have sort of like radio call-ins where we have um you our listeners use the anchor app and leave a voice message for our particular guests the best way you can keep track of that is if you are a steezy studio member um and then you're part of our steezy studio members facebook page and in that page, every once in a while, I'll post, hey, we have these guests coming on to the podcast. Uh, leave a voice message for them, and we will have them answer those questions. And so today, we're going to be starting off with a message from Jessica Holyfield. Cool. Jessica Holyfield is one of our, like, Steezy super users. When she comes here, she visits Steezy. Cool. She's probably taken, hmm. she might be the person who's taken the most Steezy classes. Wow. Maybe. Wow. It could be. And she's actually now an HHI judge. Wow, <laughs> yeah. that come up is like, amazing. Yeah, she was like shadowing wow. on the recent one and so it's pretty cool. So this, this is, is an honor. Mackenzie. Hi, this question is for Mackenzie. I wanted to ask, uh, how has it been journey wise with how you listen to music and how your movement quality has changed since being in a relationship with Philip? <laughs> and has there been any times where you felt like your perspective and his would mesh really well together on a concept or that it would be combative? Um, I would really like to hear your thoughts on that. Amazing. So my movement quality has changed since being in a relationship. Um, Philip and I talk a lot. That hmm. is something that we have, uh, that we've made a standard in our relationship, that communication. Love and I know that. that sounds super cliche, but communicating with each other and updating each other on each other's realities is the most important thing. Yes. Um, and with that, we have to really confront and challenge each other. Mm -hmm. And I remember him on a job asking me what I thought about something, mm. my just creative opinion. And I was really young when I met him, 22. Yeah. And I remember again thinking, and I don't think this was just my mentality towards NDT, but it was my mentality in general. I'm not certified to do this. Sure. My superior should be making these. Sure. 
these solutions and, and, and things. And I just, I just froze up and he was like, no, I really want to know what your opinion is on this. And I think because of him constantly questioning me, I had to sit with myself and ask myself, what do I like? What moves me? And why do I do this? Wow. And that innately changed the way that I confronted dance and choreography. And that is what influenced me 100% to get on the floor, to like physically get on the floor and start improving and freestyling there. Cause I was like, oh, for some reason, this is what makes me feel comfortable. This is interesting to mm. me. I like what movement looks like on the floor. And so I think our conversations, our deep confrontations were causing me to confront those questions in myself that I had never asked myself when it mm. came to art. And I think the way that we, so I, I think I became more of myself because he was constantly asking me who I was Yeah. because that's what our relationship is. And it still is five years later. Who are you today? And I think without that, I would have never asked. And mm -hmm. I think that's what relationships are for, regardless if they're romantic or just with family. Yeah. Ask people who they are every day and be open to getting to know them over and over again so that they have the space to change. Yes. And so I think that has that will continuously nurture our relationship and the space for each other to change within our craft. I, I love that because it reminds me of in our Six Choreographers One Song episode, mm -hmm. you mentioned how one of the, the most beautiful things about Philip is that he doesn't judge you and characterize you by your fears and yeah. like the, the person maybe that you were before. Yeah. It's, it's this check-ins on who you are now. Yeah. I think that's a beautiful thing. And you know, some, some people aren't so blessed to have met a special someone yeah. who who has conversations conversations with you and allows you to confront it yourself. Yes. Because very often people want to confront it themselves, be yes. the fixer, you know? Yes, and control the outcome. Yes. Yes. And yes. I even have problems with that. Same. And, but I think that's like, that's the good stuff. That's yeah. where you're like, oh, I, this is something I need to practice constantly. Mm. And our relationship is pushing, always pushing me into yeah. being better at that. And I definitely think I mean, we are solely working together now as a choreography duo in yeah. the industry, and it is so much fun. I wouldn't <laughs> want it any other way. And we have a completely different background mm -hmm. and idea of how we see things. But there's also, honestly, I just think it, I think it's purely a relation, like a, a reflection of our relationship. We are very different people, and we probably would go about doing things differently, but our values are the same. And yes. I feel like that's the same in the art that we make. Mm. We have a similar, uh, if not the same aim for yeah. the product. If we don't, then that's something that will be exposed in the process yes. and then we'll have to talk about it and be like, wait, what's the problem you're trying to solve? Because <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think yeah. I'm going against you. Uh. So as long as we have a similar aim mm. or same aim, the process is like, it's so fun. Cause then I'm like, oh, let me take some of my history and then yes. put it in. Does that, is that is that feeding what, what we're seeing? Yeah. And as long as we're doing that, it it is so like, there's so much perspective and beauty in that. And that's when I have the most fun. There's definitely times where I am resistant and I'm like, no, this is my way. Yeah, tell me, is but tell me about those times when you when you when you end up clashing. I, I think it's what I said. I think the aim is different. Yeah. So I think my I am trying to either control an outcome. And that's something that we've learned too. Our process is very different, mm. where he will sit and think mm. about a visual and sit and think where I am like, no, I need to like move with you and I want to like freestyle yeah, and, and yeah. create it. And so we have to, we've kind of adapted both now. Give like now take. we're, yeah, now we're getting more comfortable with allowing both things and, and, and asking for it yeah. and being like, honestly, if you, if, if you need my help, then can you kind of do this my way really quick? I love that. Asking for that help. Yeah. That's yeah. really big. And this is just my way and, and I'm going to also do your way, but you can't expect that person. No to again communi Builds communicating resentments. yes I can't yes. With that. and i've and i felt that in the past yeah. and and it's so silly because it really is just stemming from not communicating and, and so not cool. asking for for what you need so i think similar aim same aim on product and yeah. what we want to fulfill in the project together 
and being open, and this is solely for me to remember, being open to how that would come, trying not to control the yeah. way that we'll get the there, way. which Love he's that. really good at mm. allowing it to be a messy experience, yeah. where sometimes I'm like, it shouldn't be this way. Yeah, But maybe maybe it's, it, it is interesting because I really do respect how you, you're always talking from your point of view and you're saying oh, yeah. like, this is, this is how how I can improve as oh, an yeah, individual, yeah. you know, but I, I also see how there's, there's a beauty in, in structure that I'm sure you provide to Philip. Oh, a hundred percent. And I, and I know he values that. And so that's why there's really never resentment because yeah. I know, and he tells me like, I want your opinions. Mm -hmm. I want you to confront this with me. I want you to challenge me. And I'm also realizing this, and I think this is important for choreography duos to mm. know, sometimes, in our process, I'll be watching something and I'm and I'll feel the pressure of the clients watching us. And that's something that I wasn't really ready for, like for them to be in our process. I'm and not that's ready been for that. yeah, and that's been okay. something that's happening lately because we're doing live shows and yeah. film and so we're with the clients and they're as we're creating, it's not an intimate process. They're Ooh. there. And that can put pressure on our form of communication and our way of communicating and yeah. getting together. But the most important thing that I'm realizing is sometimes I'll just be like, uh, no, that's that's gonna be bad. That, that's a bad idea. Mm. This recently actually happened. We had to quickly change choreography for something that wasn't working and looking really bad. Whoa. And we had like a few minutes and I froze up and I was so nervous and he started doing stuff with me. And I was like, no, they're not gonna like that. No, I already know they're not gonna like that. And I'm actually right. I know what they want, oh. but if I keep shutting him down, Damn. then he'll never get to work with anything. And he, he, he stood there with me and he was like, we are not gonna, come out with an idea or an answer for them unless we explore. Just because I'm starting with this position doesn't mean we have to end in it, but you have to allow for the process. Yeah. And sometimes I'll just destroy the process and not have an answer for it. Mm. And he's always there to be like, okay, so why don't you like it? And do you have another option? Instead of just destroying and be no. like, I don't like it. No. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so that has been a really important Sheesh. aspect of our process together. And it's good for me, because then I'll feel myself being like, I don't like it. But then it's like, do I have an answer for why I don't like it? And mm. can I lead him in the direction of what I do like mm. to offer some counter perspective, which is helpful. Like yeah. that is way more helpful in the process rather yes. than just destroying everything. Yeah, plain, plain and simple rule of improv, yes and. Just yes. Keep yes anding, Yep. you know? Yep. You can say yes and I think this might be a better idea. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Good question. You're always allowed to throw those in. Yes. yes, good job, Jessica. That was a great Nailed question. It. Great, great question. Right. Um, let's <laughs> listen to this one from Dua Mobin. It's a little broken apart, I think. That's okay. I'm still in school, and it gets difficult to balance dance with school work. So <laughs> can I just focus on drills? Will that improve my dancing, or do I have to make time for actual choreographies? So the question is, how do you balance school and dance, and can she just focus on drills? Or mm. does she have to do choreography to also improve? Mm. So kind of two different questions. <clears throat> Growing up as a studio kid, balancing school and dance was one of the hardest things. Mm. We didn't really get into this, but school was a very uncomfortable place for me. I felt very scared at school. Again, had pretty bad social anxiety as a kid. Um, and dance ended up being my safe haven, even mm -hmm. though it was a place of discomfort at first. Mm -hmm. It eventually became the place of friendship mm -hmm. and of deep connection with myself. And school was naturally on the back burner for me and yeah. having artistic parents for them as well. Yeah. So they kind of validated me I choosing see. dance. Yeah, not everyone has that. Yes. yes. But with that, I wish that I would have carved out more time for being responsible for other things that I didn't like. You need to learn to do the things that you don't like. Mm. And I wasn't really practicing that as a kid. So that's definitely something that I'm trying to learn how to be accountable for now, just doing the things that you know you need to do. And mm. I think that is what schoolwork is for. Mm. And so carving out time for your brain to do work rather than just relying on your body is really important. But I also think that it's okay to not have to be everything at once. So if school is where you are right now, I don't think there's anything wrong with being there because the experience of school, what your brain is doing with that information will affect the way that you dance in the future, regardless if you're consciously doing it or not. Really hard to feel that 
in the moment. Oh, of course. But it's so true. And you don't know that until you get older yeah. and you see, you're like, oh gosh, the way that I was looking at shapes and geometry is literally affecting the way that I'm collaborating with this person <laughs> and, and choreographing their body. Yeah. And you don't know that and you don't know how the, and, and you shouldn't know yeah. because then, then you would keep yourself from that future knowledge. Yeah. So if school is in front of you right now, be there, mm -hmm. be in school, learn and absorb all of that because that's not forever, that's mm -hmm. very temporary. And if dance is also pulling at you the same time, <clears throat> also carve out time for that. And even though you don't have a lot in your day, like I love looking back and knowing that I was a tired kid. Mm -hmm. Like it's harder to do that now as an adult, but you have the energy when you're a bit younger mm -hmm. to just be tired and yeah. to do, to do what you love. I don't think you have to do everything, but school and dance were like, they took up the majority of my life and I wouldn't have taken, like I, I would want that to be exactly yeah. that way. Um, and then when it comes to choreography, being able, again, being able to learn choreography is so important. Being able to take direction is so important depending on wherever you want to go with it in your life. Mm. But if you don't know how to translate your ideas or visions verbally verbally mm -hmm. the longevity in your career is going to be hard to maintain and i really do think that school helps you because you pre you're practicing language and speaking and and verbalizing ideas and negotiation and all of that mm -hmm. i think it in turn will help your process as a creative so that you don't go through what i went through which was the i'm really good at direction but i don't know who i am yeah and it you have to wait until like basically 22, 24 yeah. until you feel like. Yeah, but answer. I think I think the biggest thing is be where you are. Mm. And if, if it is school, dive into school. And if you freaking love dance, you'll love it enough to stay up a little later to yeah. drill it. Yeah, I think it's like, it's one of those things where if if you value something enough, if it gives you enough of a certain joy, you naturally want to make time for it. Yeah, the hardest, and you will. Yes, you will. You will. The hardest thing is when you feel like the other thing is getting in the way of you doing that, that you build that resistance and yes. friction. And that is mostly school for people. That is but how it's But again, I think in tandem, you have to learn to show up for things you don't want to yes. do if you want longe longevity and responsibility for yes. that thing that you love doing. Mm -hmm. Because your relationship with dance, like we've talked about it, before it's going to change. Yes. And when it changes, are you going to continue to show up for it? Mm. Did you learn that resilience? It's true. That yeah. sort of yeah, resilience, mental fortitude, emotional grit. fortitude. Yep. Grit. Perfect yeah. word for it. Your grit in all yeah. aspects. Do you have that? And we can't, again, we can't easily just prepare for that and be like, you know, the reason I'm doing school is because I'm trying to build my grit. No one thinks about <laughs> no, that. No. But you did it and then you end up being able to pursue it later. That's exactly. Great. And and also just to make sure we answer that last bit of the question, like you said, um, should we do drills and choreography? Can you just do drills? Or should you also do choreography? Both are important. Yeah, and right? I think it's, what is your personal aim with it? Yes. Be conscious about why you're doing them. Are mm. you doing them to get better technically? Yes. Probably. Yes. But then what are you gonna do with that? Yes. There is a point where if you're just doing that all of the time, it, it, to me, it's like money and investment. You can say yes to a job that's making you a lot of money, but if you don't know what you're going to be investing it in, you're going to be stuck in that mm -hmm. wheel and in that cycle, and then there's less growth and perspective in that process. And I think yes. as dancers, in all of us, regardless of what we want to do with it, especially people that are like technical and want to do drills and choreography, I think there's still a part of you that wants to express yourself yes. and figure out who you are as an individual and as an artist. Mm -hmm. And I think with that, you have to take the time apart mm. from doing that technical stuff. And maybe the technical stuff gives you more ammo yeah. and vocabulary to pull from when you're asking yourself those deeper, more uh, intimate questions. And maybe that's your aim. Maybe it's like, I want more technique. I wanna be better yeah. body wise so that I can feel better when I'm making my creative decisions. Maybe yes. that's the aim, but it's, making sure that you know why you're doing it and what it will be invested in. Yeah, and I like what you said about choreography. Like it, it, it also provides perspective. And I think perspective is oh, yeah. a really big thing. I think that rather than thinking of choreography as a grouping of moves, it's very <laughs> often just simply a vessel for perspective. Yep. And so those moves, you might know every single move in the choreography, but all of a sudden, for some reason, it's hard. You've drilled those moves before, <laughs> you've done before. Why can't you tie them together? Well, because the why, the approach, um, 
and the reasoning is just different. And so I think as we're developing as dancers, as our own artists, it's really important for us to, um, we need to be okay with finding our whys through other people in the beginning and taking in those perspectives. Yes, and that's a safe way to do it. And mm -hmm. I think that's when I learned from a young age that I liked doing my own thing was through other people's choreography and realizing yeah. I was changing it to make mm. it feel, and that was my favorite part of class was like, okay, I get to learn the choreography and then I get to sit with myself and make it feel like mine. Yes. And I think that was a seed that I constantly wanted to continue to water. And I think it makes sense now that I just want to be in charge of yeah. myself and what I totally. what I do, but without choreography and without drills, that's not something that I think I would have known. Yes. So good. Yeah. So good. This is from Kiana Rogers. Hi, Kiana. This question is for Mackenzie Dustman. Um, I'll be taking classes to like understand and perform the technical aspects of dance, but how do I bring out my essence or personality as a dancer? Similar questions here. Yes, I'm gonna give a different perspective. Please. I would say don't dance, do more life. Love this. Yeah. Yes, do more life. Uh, I think this is a question that I think you sent that I don't know if we've tapped into, but I think an unhealthy habit that we adopt as dancers is that we rely on our body so much mm. and we don't learn how to verbally communicate or translate sensations into real time. Yeah. And the more life that I experienced, if that's just me having friendship mm. and going outside of the studio to connect with the world, I have more archives to pull from when it comes to emotional experience, mm. getting in relationships, learning how to negotiate with people and grow with people. Um, one of my most previous things that I've created that I've loved, I created this like dance short uh, called Interior Woman. Mm -hmm. And it was the first thing that I pretty much directed and created by myself. And it was literally pulled from an experience last year in China where I was suffering from one of my first like panic attacks as an adult. Wow. and that literally, that experience was immediately translated into art. And if I Whoa. didn't allow myself to experience that discomfort fully, experience mm -hmm. life fully, I wouldn't have any ammo for mm. my art. So I think you need to just go experience life. Yeah, and then at that point, we we are not necessarily treating dance as an escape or treating it no, as- No, it's confrontation. Yes. To me, and that is the biggest thing in my 20s that I'm realizing as I grew up, most dancers, again, we rely on our bodies to express ourselves, but we never actually confront the yeah. issue. And it sucks because after an hour of freestyle, you just do feel better. Mm -hmm. So you don't feel like you have to do any more, but those emotions and those experiences are still there. Yeah. And un until you learn how to communicate those patterns to people mm -hmm. and to yourself, you actually aren't becoming a stronger person. Yes. And so through through taking time out of dance that has taught me who I am as an artist. Yeah. I do have one question kind of around yeah. that. The confrontation of emotion. I feel like it's easy because art, so not a dancer, but like yeah. music is a way that I, you know, engage with emotion. Yeah. Uh, writing sometimes even. Mm. I feel like that takes practice though, right? To be 100%. able to confront that. And mm. I think one of the things I'm realizing about realizing about myself is that I actually can look at my like tougher emotions, hmm. but in a way that's kind of like fish tanked where I'm like, this is what that looks like. This is what that looks like. And I can talk about it, but I don't like engage with it. Mm. Do you feel like that like took some time either for you, both of y'all like to say, this is what I'm feeling and this is how I want to either express it? Or do you think that was just like a natural flow of things? Of no, it's definitely not natural. But again, yeah. I think it stemmed from my relationship with Philip because right. we're constantly confronting with each other. And mm -hmm. again, I've gotten enough evidence that our relationship is stronger for it mm -hmm. because of the confrontation. But I think it's exactly what you said. Like, I think when you are confronting it, when you're confronting it through movement, it can be hard. But the cool thing about the experience that I had is I had to write it down. I had to be Ooh. like, what? what am I feeling? And it was scary because 
I didn't want to experience the panic again. Yeah. And panic attacks are terrible and I would never wish them upon anyone. Mm -hmm. And so I was actually scared having to tap back into it because I, I also didn't, I don't want to be a suffering artist. Mm. I don't want to have to use outside external factors to create from a vulnerable place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I also want to be honest yeah. about my experience. And that's a really hard thing to navigate. And just what I found was from asking, like literally writing down on my iPad, what was this experience? How was my heart feeling? How was my nervous system feeling during this? And then connecting it to the music that I was choosing and feeling like that music on its own represented that. It made the visuals just Mm. come through me so easily right. totally and it's cool because actually through that i was also like reading books at the same time and i was finding these parallels through the concept and actually at the end of that process the concept changed completely from it being about anxiety to how to live in tandem with the parts of myself that scare me mm -hmm. and it ended up not being oh i was i'm a victim of anxiety or panic attacks that has nothing to do with me i experience them mm. but how can I live with them and actually honor those parts of myself that are questioning everything and allow them to exist next to me? When I made space for that, it went away. Mm. Right. And that experience would have never happened if I didn't dissect that through my the concept video that I was making. Yeah, right. And I feel like that takes a lot to not just name it, but also feel it, oh, yeah. embody it, let it have its process with you because yeah. again i get really good at naming and being like this is what it is without actually touching it yes or letting it actually process yes through me, and you know? through that experience it ch it starts to change and take shape and then you realize you're like god i i was naming it and then just letting it be that story yeah. mm -hmm. instead of letting it fulfill its track Ooh. and when you let it do that it goes away yeah mm -hmm. it and it's just like meditation meditation teaches you to just listen Mm -hmm. and witness and eventually the sounds and the and the thoughts they eventually change yeah mm -hmm. and i think if you don't allow for that process to go they get stuck within you yeah i think that the the biggest thing is is you, you mentioned honoring and mm -hmm. the way that i've always viewed the term honoring or i've come to view honoring is, mm -hmm. is to treat as if precious mm -hmm. and i think that we can do that with people in so many ways but within mm -hmm. ourselves if we don't even treat the things mm. that we need to confront yeah. as if they are precious because yeah. they're, they're the thing we don't want, right? Yeah. Even if it's as simple as like, I mm. have choreo block. I can't choreograph right now. Yeah. There's something blocking it. Yes, we just run into some days where we're not feeling it, but there are things, there are actual factors. And sometimes yes. it's important to treat that like it's precious, that moment. There's a reason for it. How do we meditate? How do we yes. sit in this? Yes. Dissect that within ourselves. Not just name that, ooh, must be that one trauma. Push through, let's dance, let's go, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I think you have to, it always goes back to aim for me. It goes back to what do you want out of your life? Mm. Do you want to journey into the depths of truth mm. or do you want to avoid discomfort and stay in denial of what you're capable of and what mm -hmm. the world is about. And so I think asking yourself those philosophical questions, they will always naturally affect your process mm. of life. The mm. way you communicate with people, the way you don't communicate with people, the way you communicate with yourself, the way you don't confront yourself. So actively choosing and knowing, and this is the, this is the beautiful thing about art, is I think it does teach us to ask those questions. Like as artists, we are going into the unknown and kind of telling everyone like, oh, you can make something out of this yeah. and you're not mm -hmm. gonna die. It creates like a safe place to confront. Yeah. Um, but I think if you, if you don't take the step into that, you really are missing out on what life is. And that is about being really uncomfortable, but living through it. Yeah. And that was one of the biggest things that that concept video was about. It was mm. about going to your threshold and being like, there's no way I can live another day like this, mm. but then you do. Interior woman. Interior woman. We'll, we'll put that in the show notes if you guys want to watch the video. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Josh, the expansion. Yeah, that was awesome. So we did mention um, some an unhealthy habit, mm -hmm. right? And so I am curious about those, what are some of those healthy 
habits hmm. that you did adopt as a dancer and what are some unhealthy ones? Oh man, healthy habits. Definitely physical activity and movement being a non-negotiable in my life. I think dance teaches you that. Mm. As a dancer, you are just a little bit more sensitive to the repercussions of when you're not moving yeah. and when you're not being physically active. I think you are quicker to be like, oh, something's missing. My body kind of hurts and I need, I need like, it's like you getting your shoes. I just need to walk more. Yeah, I, I just need, and more. you just know. Yeah. Um, so I think that is one of the healthiest things that I've adopted as, as being a dancer and seeing dancers in general. We are so connected to what we need to do to stay healthy, what to put in our bodies. And even if we're not doing it, we just, we know that there is a standard of being healthier, yes. which I think is really cool. Yes, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Unhealthy habits? Before I was talking about how we tend to rely on our bodies and we never learn how to verbally communicate that process, mm. I think that's something that can be really unhealthy. Yeah. I always thought that I was someone that was really honest, had my heart on my sleeve. Yeah. I was like that as an artist, but as a human, I was never translating that. Yeah. And again, that was exposed in my relationship mm. with Philip. He was the first person to ask me questions about why I was feeling that way or why I felt like I needed to go dance and then not actually talk it through with him. Yeah. And if you want to create really reliable relationships in your life, you have to be able to communicate. And especially coming from a dancer to being a choreographer, you don't even realize how much your job is as a choreographer negotiating between departments, yep. communicating your vision to people. And yep. if you're not able to articulate what is going on inside of you and what you are seeing, no one trusts you. I agree with that. So I think one of the an unhealthier habits that a dancer has is not being able to verbalize their feelings, visions, and creations. Yeah, it's such a it's such a physical thing. Not yeah. even just art; it's just physical. Mm -hmm. And so we end up thinking that we can rely on the main vessel of that expression. Mm -hmm. um, actually, there was a, a, a Steezy member named Amal Gupta, mm -hmm. and he was asking me a question because he was teaching beginner classes, mm -hmm. and he was saying like people just aren't getting it, mm. and. and he was asking for some advice on that. And I said, you should be able to speak your entire piece without physically doing it hmm. and have the audience understand it. And that is so hard because yes. if you're in a class and it's beginners especially, are you able to put vocabulary that is beginner friendly? Not saying, okay, now we're gonna hit that Reebok and make sure that you <laughs> milk it, have those dynamics. Mm -hmm, you know, you're know, you not mm -hmm. using this terminology throughout. Yeah. And so how do you make your vision digestible, legible, understandable for the particular audience that you have? Being able to speak your whole routine as best as you can without even doing it and being able to teach that, that's when you can be a teacher. Oh yeah. The best teacher that you can be. Yep, and we, know? Philip and I really learned that when we went to China mm. because language was taken out of the question. Wow. <laughs> we couldn't represent ourselves in the way that we could here. Mm. We knew our ideas that we were pitching to the clients was getting translated and we couldn't control mm. the outcome of how they would take that translation. And because of that, our vision wasn't encompassed fully. And then we seemed like we weren't being properly reflected in our I work. See. So once we got back to the States, and, and the thing is crazy, even with English, there are still communicative problems in the process. Yeah. But the sharper, more specific, and more articulated that you can be in your vocabulary, the closer you can get to a shared reality with the yes. people that you're working with. Shared reality, that's good. Yeah, and that's, again, something Philip and I are constantly doing in our relationship that we wanna do with everyone around us the best that we can. Nice, yes, that's yeah. great. All right, we're, we're, we're getting close to the end. And this has been so fun. It's been so like, nice. Le learning so much. So many things. Yeah. Um, hmm. Okay. What are some of the biggest fears you face as a professional dancer? Hmm. And did you have these fears before you became a professional dancer? Right now, I'm actually in the process of letting go of being a professional dancer. And it's not like, oh, I'm done. Yeah. But I feel so excited about being behind the scenes and being a creative mm -hmm. 
that I know it's just something I need to go with wow. right now, but it's really terrifying letting go of that identity that you've been building up for yeah. so long that you've been constantly justified and validated in and, and how to also maintain my relationship with dance in the process of mm, that transition. Yeah. But as a professional dancer, I think I was just always, I, I was just always afraid I wasn't good enough. I think that's pretty typical of people. I'm really trying to figure out where the root of that is mm. because I was so well nurtured. Like I really had people in my corner that were like, you're good mm. and not even you're good, but like you love it. Perhaps is the love and the pursuit of that sort of weirdness and individuality that you have found something that has strengthened you and pushed you towards a certain direction. But do you feel that maybe now you're missing some of the aspects that you originally respected and loved so much? <laughs> 100%. You you said that so well. Thank you. <laughs> you said that so well. I have nothing more to say than that's exa I think you are my therapist. <laughs> I, I think you just I'll unlocked charge you later. Yeah, 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 I think you just unlocked all of the answers. Um yeah, all of the stuff. Oh, I I feel like that's your 20s though. Like mm. you are like fuck everything I learned. Yeah. I'm going to start over and these yeah. are my new beliefs and then you're like who am I? Yeah. And also those beliefs were important and there's yeah. a part of those things that actually made sense of who I am. Mm. But I think that is that is the process. That is the process. Mm. I think now that we're talking about it more, uh, as a professional dancer, I really just didn't trust my, I didn't trust myself enough. I didn't trust my opinions. And I think that's why I've naturally leaned into the choreographic role because it's just forced me to face that fear. Mm. And I, I have chosen consciously that that is what my life is for, regardless of how uncomfortable it makes me, that this is just about me leaning into what makes me uh, nervous. Mm. As, a, as a person who you know, grew up understanding that they have anxiety mm -hmm. and, and having to continually face that fear and put yourself in the positions to just, just confront every aspect mm. of yourself, it's like, it's funny because it sounds like the absolute most stressful life there is. Yeah. And also the most rewarding life you could ever experience. <laughs> yeah. And I, again, goes back to AIM. It's like, our, I used to answer questions that Philip would ask me about life. What do you want out of life? I want to feel good. I want to be happy. Yeah. And those were kind of like my early 20s, all of my upbringing morals and values. And now happiness is not my AIM. Mm. And once I changed that, it made room for more of those uncomfortable scenarios. And it made sense with the story I was now telling myself. Because if I'm telling myself I just want to be happy, then how am I going to handle suffering? <laughs> I'm not going to handle it very well. Yeah. I want to be good at handling suffering. I want to be a freaking boss at handling it. I want to be, I'm always going to be scared. Yeah. That's not going to go away. So I might as well just like, be able to do this and be like, well, it's going to happen anyway. So I might as well just consciously do it instead of be surprise attacked from the yeah. back. I'd rather like consciously choose to go into the layer, yeah. the, the, the the dragon's layer, than it just come and find me because it mm. will, it does all of us. Yeah. So yeah, that's once I changed my goal, which is relatively recent, like within this year wow. of being like, oh, happiness isn't my aim. Truth is the aim. Mm. And with that comes serious confrontation I, and I, discomfort. I think I think like uh, something my wife helped me differentiate. Maybe this isn't the actual definition, but it's the definitions we've tied to these words. Mm -hmm. But happiness, uh, happiness as a moment and then joy as a perpetuity. Yeah. And I think hmm. like it's beautifully like said, you're yeah. experiencing so much joy through knowing your growth and improvement and and even when you fall back into an old habit you are do, you are better at not judging yourself for that because that thing has taken away from your happiness from yep. that moment you just had it why do you have to ruin my happiness me stop yeah. ruining this moment you know yeah. but i think finding joy in dance finding joy when you when you don't make that audition but being yeah. like whole oh, wow i i got an audition i showed up i showed up that's yep. crazy you yes know? and it's hard to do all of that stuff and i even think about that 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 moment in china where i was so disconnected from myself i felt like everything around me was shattering my identity everything mm. 
And now I have evidence that I lived through it. Mm. And with that, that, that joy, it's just like for me, I, I now have enough evidence that through confrontation comes immense peace and fulfillment. And that I'm, I'm down. If that's, if that's the method that we have to go about this, then I will take the discomfort, mm. however it is, to be able to experience that. But wow. then it also goes with what you were saying of not trying to grasp it. Mm. Because if you try to grasp the happiness and that's something that you practice, then you are also grasping onto that negativity yeah. experience. And if you are willing to let those things flow through you, you get really good at knowing, okay, this too shall pass. Mm -hmm. Happiness is not gonna stay. The joy is not gonna stay. But to be able to feel that for one moment, I'm so lucky yes. that I know that it exists and that that can be my momentum and reminder in the future when I'm confronting something terrible yeah. that I will live through this. It's a refinement process. Yeah. Really refinement process. Yep. Can't stay in the fire forever though. Yeah. You will hmm. live through this. You will. Steezy listeners, hmm. you will live through this, whether it is your schoolwork, mm -hmm. the difficult um, challenges with parents and having them trust in your dance journey or that first audition or the first dance class, live dance class, or maybe you're gonna teach it. You will live through this. You will move on to the next step. Just don't forget to enjoy that step. Mm. You're not getting it back. Yeah. Kenzie, we did it. We did it. This that was been, special. This has been so fun. Thank you so much. That took my mind into some like really important things that I know when I leave here, I'm going to be pondering. Be like, All right, <laughs> how can I go deeper into that? There was something that. there. It was so nice. Having to sit down and articulate what's been happening is so important to mm. do. And this has just forced me to do that. So I appreciate you for having me and letting me like confront myself here. Yeah. <laughs> it was no, cool. I mean, thank you for being vulnerable enough yeah, to share course. it with you know, everyone here. Of course. Well, Mackenzie, is there anything that you wanted to tell the audience that you have coming up? Anything that's exciting? Hmm. Yeah. So Philip and I have been working on a private project this past year. Private project. We've been living half of our time in Vegas, half of our time in LA. So it's something that has taken us to Vegas. I can't talk about it, okay. but it is a live experience okay. that will exist soon i love that it'll exist it will exist that's an exciting <laughs> word to use will i yes. be able to exist alongside and view it possibly yes. okay okay yes I'm i pumped. won't say no all right she won't say no yeah she's not saying 100%. anything, anything. <laughs> <laughs> all right well thank you of Mackenzie, course. and thank it's you a pleasure for everyone here that left a voice message yes. for us on the anchor app again if you want to leave a message for future episodes you can leave a general question for any dancer that comes on or you can make sure that you are a steezy member and you can leave a message directly when i post in our steezy facebook members page who our next guest on the podcast is going to be get your specific question answered by our amazing guests Kenzie, thank you. Thank you so much, Clay. Josh Yang, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. You and you. And we'll see you next time on the CZ Podcast. Woohoo! Bye! Thanks again for tuning in. Again, this podcast was brought to you by us, Steezy Studio. Be sure to get your dance on today, too. So if you want to get some exercise in, take a Steezy sweat class. If you want to just vibe out and feel good, you definitely need to check out a good groove along. Or if you're up for the challenge, it's time to finally start one of those advanced classes you've been eyeballing. We'll see you in class. This podcast was produced by Josh Jang and edited by Leah Gradonia. The music for the podcast is titled Tempo by Neiman.